right, well, thank you. Good evening. Uh, feel free to cuddle in a little bit here. You can get uh, a good view. It's scintillating up here, the closer you are to the screen. Um, well, in June of 1930, a Presbyterian church outside Milwaukee ordained Sarah Dixon to the office of ruling elder. The following day, the Milwaukee Sentinel here reported that history had been made. Dixon was the first woman to be regularly ordained to the ruling eldership in the entire history of American Presbyterianism, a history that stretches back to 1706. Just a couple of days prior to her ordination, the Presbyterian General Assembly adopted new amendments to its Book of Order that opened ruling eldership to women. So Milwaukee's Sarah Dixon became a first in history. Over the next year, a handful of other women across the country became ruling elders in their churches, and the General Assembly seated five women as voting delegates in 1931. How did this come about? In the period between the two world wars, in the 1920s and 30s, Presbyterians, Methodists, Episcopalians, Baptists, and Congregationalists all wrestled with the question of women's ordination. Why? The story of women's ordination in the early 20th century has to do less with a shift in theology, I'll argue, as it does with a shift in the everyday routines and practices of Protestant religious life. Now, this is a Davenant lecture series that's dedicated to honoring the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. Why am I talking about events that occurred 90 years ago instead of 500 years ago? Well, the answer lies in the fact that the priorities of the reformers and the legacy that they left to us, I think, speak to important questions that arise at other times in church history. If the Reformation matters, and I believe it does, then it mattered not just in the 16th century only. The uh, 16th century reformers challenged in their day some long-standing notions of church office and the nature of their challenge and much of what lay behind it, I think, can inform us as we reflect in other time periods. The reformers rejected clerical immunity, the idea that priests could never be brought before civil courts. They rejected clerical celibacy, the idea that priests must never marry. They rejected the idea that priests possess a greater heavenly dignity than lay people. They rejected holy orders as a sacrament. They established the office of elder or ruler or ruling elder or lay elder grounded in the understanding that spiritual authority is the province of the whole body of Christ in its head and members and not, uh, not uh, authority that is simply vested in the few who hold ecclesiastical office. Their legacy helps us to understand the 1920s and 30s, helps us to understand today, and so that's why I wanted to spend some time in the early 20th century in recognition of the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. Now, historians of American religion describe the 1920s, the Roaring Twenties, as a decade of theological controversy where we experience debates over creation, evolution, fundamentalism, and modernism. But Protestants also wrestled with issues that aren't really reducible to bare theological ideas. There was just as much discussion about bobbed hair and dancing and movies and prohibition of alcohol and jazz and poverty and children in the workplace and divorce. So when it comes to the issue of women's ordination, most historians have tried to account for the change in women's status in the church by ex examining how people theologized about women. But the theological arguments for women's ordination that prevailed in the 1920s were actually the same old arguments that had been around for at least by then a couple of generations. In fact, the most widely referenced book in the ordination debates of the 1920s was a book that had been published way back in 1889. The arguments for women's ordination in the 1920s had not changed at all for the last several decades. The old familiar arguments, though, finally met a favorable hearing. So if the theological arguments hadn't changed, what did change? And that's the historical question I aim to answer. 
the theology of women's status in the church wasn't changing, yet women's status in the church was changing. We find the answer then by examining the everyday routines, the material objects, and even architectural space, all of which reveal an administrative revolution, I argue, that transformed American Protestantism in the early decades of the 20th century. I argue that this administrative revolution came freighted with gendered significance and it fueled the change in women's status. So here's my project. My argument is that the rise of women's ordination had to do less with changes in theology, which is the thing that historians typically point to, than it had to do with an administrative transformation, a transformation that swept across American Protestantism in this time. All right. So I'm going to Proceed then by describing this administrative transformation. I'm going to leave women's ordination aside for a moment and talk about the cultural, uh, the cultural comings and goings of Protestantism at the time. And then I'll bring, bring in the gendered implications of how it all took shape. All right. So first then to the administrative transformation. At the turn of the 20th century, Protestants across the United States placed administration at the center of their religious life and at the center of their religious practice. They consolidated their missionary and educational and benevolence organizations. They integrated local and regional and national expressions of church life. They extolled organizational efficiency as the cardinal virtue of a unique renewal movement. Over the centuries, Christians have met Jesus in prayer or perhaps in the waters of baptism or at the communion table. Others found Jesus in seclusion. Some found him in, in miracles, in fasting and other deprivations, in performing selfless acts of charity, in music, in soul-stirring sermons. But here in the early 20th century, American Protestants met Jesus by organizing. They partook of divine grace in activities that could be diagrammed on flowcharts, tallied in ledgers, organized in filing cabinets, printed in bulletins, and moved, seconded, adopted, and recorded in minutes. So I want to talk about a few facets of this uh, administrative transformation. I'm going to talk about architecture. I'm going to talk about church record keeping practices. I'm gonna talk about habits of giving and benevolence. And I'll talk about print culture, including newsletters and Sunday bulletins. And then finally, that'll bring us back around to women's ordination, which was our jumping off point. I wanna begin with architecture. Uh, this is one of the buildings I like to visit when I go to Philadelphia. Um, and I think architecture might be the most uh, symbolic of the transformation uh, that I want to point to here. Uh, and I want to point specifically to the rise of church office spaces in the early 20th century. So uh, this is Art Street Presbyterian Church. It was built in 1913. It's in downtown Philadelphia. You walk close to it if you're going to take the Rocky Balboa run up by the, uh, the steps of the Museum of Art. Um, and uh, I want you to notice it's a beautiful building built in 1913, but I looked at the, uh, the early conceptual plans, and what I circled here on the right is something that's pretty unique, the office, the church office. You see, this was a new thing that was developing. Um, I can take you to another church in Memphis, Tennessee, Idlewild Presbyterian Church. Um, it's a beautiful church. You can see its interior uh, this, was, this went up in 1928, um, and its uh, design uh, its design is fascinating, but what I've circled here, you surely can't see the labels, but uh, that shows office spaces. Office spaces. These are new spaces that you would not have seen in a church that was built, say, in 1890 or in 1895. This is a room that's got a particular function that enters into the architecture of church office building design in the first decades of the 20th century. Um, and it shows uh, in this, uh, this here, this is uh, 
taken from the American Architect, which is a leading architectural magazine, one of the most prominent trade magazines at the time, um, in an article about how to design a church in 1925. So this is put forward not as the design of a particular church, but sort of this ideal design to show typical ways that you're going to design a church here. And it's got the office that I've circled there. Now what's interesting, the same, this is the same trade journal, go back a quarter century to 1900. Um, here is a, a plan view, and then you see on, on the left, you've got the plan view, and then the, uh, the layout, which I've kind of blown up on the right. 1900, no office. 1925, the office space is there. 1900, the office space is not there in a typical church building design, what the author identifies as a typical church building design. Um, office spaces emerged as new features in ecclesiastical architecture uh, in the early 20th century. What did they do in these architectural spaces that were new spaces that hadn't previously been in church designs? They did a host of things, and I'm going to spend some time exploring that. The demands of congregational life became what one observer described as a seven-day task. It was no longer the case that churches were busy only on Sundays. They had youth programs, gatherings of women's societies, prayer meetings, the daily buzz of congregational activity that required coordination and staffing to manage. I can go back to that uh, church in Memphis, Idlewild, in 1928. One of the best illustrations of this new development, I can focus in on one illustration of it is Sunday schools. Sunday schools, and uh, this is the second story of Idlewild. The first story has the office spaces, um, but this is the whole regime of Sunday schools, and I, could, uh, I have a lot to say about that, but for our purposes, just a, a few things I wanna highlight here. Um, and that is during this time, local Sunday schools increasingly adapted their teaching regimen to fit with standards that were growing, that were growing more and more exacting standards that applies across entire regions and ultimately from coast to coast. These standards were often disseminated from denominational publishing houses that published graded Sunday school materials. And the denominations, of course, applied training uh, and disseminated these standards for local Sunday school teachers. And so we see things like this. Uh, Sunday school administrators then, uh, they uh, tracked enrollments. Um, here's a generic registration form that was created for use in a Baptist Sunday school system that Presbyterians, a Presbyterian publisher promoted in 1921 as an ideal example. And of course, uh, so this is the pupil's enrollment record, and then the teacher needs to keep a record for each student. Uh, these student records are compiled by the officers in the Sunday school department for larger Sunday schools, um, or for the general officer for smaller Sunday schools, and then the general secretaries. Uh, a working form that's going to be submitted to the Sunday school superintendent. And here's the superintendent's reporting form that he submits to the church leadership. Did you follow all that? And of course, uh, uh, this last one here is the progress report card that uh, goes home to parents. All right. Uh, this is some of the things that took place in those church office spaces administering Sunday schools and creating uh, records and keeping records like this, records that could be mit submitted for regional uh, tabulation and national tabulation and statistical assessment. Other things were happening um, in terms of record keeping, not just Sunday school records, but the entire work of the church became accountable to a regime of standardized record keeping. One of the things I do in my studies is I look at uh, church minutes, like uh, elders minutes, things like that. And it's interesting to watch how reports and minutes from different local churches, say, if you're reading, if you look at them from the 1870s, 1880s, when they change secretaries or something, you can see that the minutes are going to radically change. They take on the idiosyncrasies of who, who's ever keeping the records. By the time you get to the late 19 teens and especially into the 1920s, uh, uh, record keeping becomes standardized. It's interesting to watch how reports and minutes lose their local idiosyncrasies and, and grow more uniform. 
uh, in these early decades of the 20th century. And denominations began promulgating norms for how churches need to re record and preserve all kinds of information about their activities. And local church practice then followed suit. So this is the form of a presbyterial report to the General Assembly. And so if you're a presbytery, you needed to collect all this information and the individual churches needed to submit um, and that sort of thing. We see this standardization in record keeping of all sorts of things, not just the Sunday schools. Um, and of course, this could be analyzed and uh, reduced to statistics. You wouldn't have seen something like this in 1910, but by, 19, by the 1920s, um, it's all over the place. Um, in 1922, the Presbyterians reorganized their ent entire denomination and appointed a new form of the stated clerk who was fit for office because he was identified as a shark with statistics. That's the qualifications for the denominational stated clerk. So we've talked about Sunday school and other types of record keeping activities. One of the most interesting, another uh, of these developments, one of the most interesting is uh, the pledge system. Pledging requires individual donors to declare how much money they're going to give in the future. Denominational officials began imposing this practice after managers of denominational agencies started preparing budgets. And budgeting requires making projections into the future. Now, prior to the 20th century, boards and agencies were funded by offerings that were collected in local churches. Somebody representing the missions board would travel in an itinerancy and give missions updates about missions work and they would take up a collection that Sunday for foreign missions, it would be sent in to the missions board and that's how the missions board would be funded. Whatever the missions board received in this way is what they had to spend. In 1912, the Presbyterian General Assembly determined to replace this age old practice with, with the pledge system so it could predict the level of support that they would receive in the coming year. Um, and uh, this system required local churches then to restructure the way they collected funds. And more importantly, it called upon individual parishioners to alter their practice of Christian giving. And to facilitate the collection of these pledges then, denominational publishing houses got into the mix, printed and disseminated pledge cards for distribu distribution to individual church members. Denominational managers trained teams in every church to call on parishioners and present them with a card. Parishioners had to write down on the card the specific amounts they promised to give over the course of the coming year. To make it easier to collect these subscriptions, the denomination also furnished printed envelopes for use in local churches. The most popular were the double pocket envelopes. Uh, they were numbered and dated for each week of the year. You'd get 52 envelopes that were predated for each Sunday out of the 52 weeks of the year with two pockets in it. In one pocket you put your giving for the local church and the other pocket you're giving for denominational agencies. To ensure uniformity in the recording of pledges and collections, the denomination supplied record sheets uh, for the treasurers in every church. These had to be kept according to uniform standards. This new pledge system routinized Christian charity by linking denominational headquarters to every individual church member through a system of regional administrators. In the words of the Presbyterian General Assembly, this new pledge system brings the individual subscriber into close touch with his own church and with the great worldwide enterprises undertaken by the Presbyterian church as a whole. It results in giving a business system to our financial methods. So Presbyterians heralded this vertical integration, as business people would call it, as a sacred achievement. Again, the General Assembly de declared that a coordination and system of church organization magnifies weekly giving as an act of worship. Well, if we've got local church office spaces that are new ecclesiastical features during this time, and these are spaces where a new administrative work takes place, a uh, re closely related development in ecclesiastical architecture during this time. I mean, some historians like to talk about medieval churches and Gothic architecture and so on. I study late 19th and early 20th century ecclesiastical architecture with offices, but uh, 
We also have denominational headquarters operations buildings. New features in ecclesiastical architecture start springing up in the late 19th and early 20th century. Headquarters buildings, denominational headquarters buildings. This is uh, an early one, the Methodist Book Concern from 1888. Uh, there's a photograph of what it looks like today. One of my favorites on Fifth Avenue in New York, the Presbyterian building. That's what it uh, used to look like. There's a photograph of the Presbyterian building today. And today it uh, houses uh, a shoe shop that's owned by Sarah Jessica Parker. Um, beautiful building, congregational house uh, in Boston, Massachusetts. There you see it with, uh, with a wagon, a horse-drawn uh, carriage out front. Um, that's what it looks like today. That bu building is still standing. It's the archives for the, for the congregational uh, church, very important archives. And uh, if you were attentive to popular TV programming in the late 80s, early, early 1990s, you would see that that was the building for the exterior shots of the uh, law firm in the old show, Ally McBeal. But my favorite, uh, I dragged my family to this in Philadelphia, is the Witherspoon Building. Um, the, it's the Presbyterian Board of Publication Building uh, that's still standing today. Um, and uh, the architectural fabric of it, the Witherspoon building is just, you see the medallions and then you've got all these greats of Presbyterian history, Charles Hodge, Westminster Divines, Church of Scotland, Church of Ireland, John Knox, John Calvin, and so on. Also in Philadelphia, Philadelphia has always been a center of publishing. And so a lot of the de denomination, I'm, that goes back to Ben Franklin's print shop um, historically. And so all of these publishing operations for the denom big denominations uh, spring up in Philadelphia where their editorial offices in, are in New York and the publishing houses themselves um, are in Philadelphia. So the Shaft Building, which is uh, still there in Philadelphia, and that's what it looks like today. Um, all right. Uh, a lot of uh, headquarters buildings then. Headquarters buildings are new to the architectural landscape for ecclesiastical architecture which are the buildings that are coordinated with the activities that are taking place within the local church in these office spaces. So there's an architectural story of a transformation in Protestantism that's taking place uh, during this time. Um, I've anticipated this. Uh, now, taking you to another important function that took place in church offices. And this brings us to uh, newsletters and bulletins. In the early 20th century, Protestants across the United States began turning out form letters, bulletins, calendars, newsletters. All this locally generated printed material allowed parishioners to keep abreast of needs to meet, causes to support, and events to take part in throughout the week. Their publications announced exciting events coming up. They helped members stay abreast of progress in fundraising, outreach work, and other projects. Seniors could learn what the youth, youth in the church were up, up to, and parents could take pride in seeing their kids' accomplishments in print. Protestants used locally pro printed material to rally parishioners to action, to solidify their ties to the church community, and draw prospective members into the buzz and camaraderie of congregational life. By the 1920s, most American Protestants received a printed bulletin when they entered a house of worship on Sunday mornings. This was a new development at the time. You receive a church bulletin on Sunday, you need to realize that that development is less than 100 years old. At this time, uh, that development was as new to their religious routine as showing up to worship by automobile. The faithful enlisted small time Hearsts and Pulitzers as religious workers to work in those office spaces where they inked and turned the drums of their tabletop duplicating machines and they forged a new print culture that reshaped their religious communities. Um, this one is uh, particularly interesting. This is very typical here. Uh, this one's from the 1920s, this Palm Sunday Bulletin. But denominations got into the, into the mix here. Denominations would generate pre-printed bulletins that had professionally printed covers you know, stacks of them that, that the church secretary and the local church then could put into the duplicating machines. And so you've got the denominations linking themselves to the local activities of the church. They would often publish uh, a sort of boilerplate calendars as well. 
that had denominational things on the calendars, yet blank spaces that could also be added to as they're run through the mimeographs in the church offices. Um, fascinating development. Now, historians have been studying print culture for some time, um, and, and they've noted rightly that around the turn of the 20th century, mass printing aimed at the everyman helped construct a national consumer identity. Um, new financing and uh, transportation arteries allowed publishers and writers and advertisers to circulate magazines and newspapers. And through these printed materials, they disseminated their values and spread them out across the counter countertops and coffee tables and bedside stands from coast to coast. My research reveals a similar process at work in a more localized level in local church contexts with the advent of church newsletters and bulletins. And I think this is one of the most significant aspects of the broader administrative transformation that I'm talking about here. What became of this localized print culture? Um, well, uh, I kind of uh, brought it up here, two major consequences here. Uh, a shift away from forming religious I community identity around personal bonds and toward a less personal and mediated notion of religious solidarity. So in previous eras, the Protestant faithful had defined sacred communities around their face-to-face -face Sunday gatherings by hearing sermons together, by singing hymns together, by praying together, and by other ritual acts. But now, Protestants began shaping congregational identity by printing ink onto paper and by circulating it and reading. A second consequence it is one that print shares then with other forms of administration that I've been describing. Printing, like other office activity, is going to open new opportunities for women in Protestant church life. I promised to get to women's ordination at the outset. I'm still not there yet, but um, we're going to get there. Uh, more on print, though, and how this unfolds. Um, the mimeograph uh, was one of the first small printing machines to be manufactured in large numbers. This is Albert B. Dick of Chicago. He gave the mimeograph its name back in 1887 when he purchased the patent from its inventor, Thomas Edison. Uh, the mime mimeograph fit pretty easily onto a desktop or on a table, and it didn't require much training to operate. And it produced a printed page by mechanically pressing ink uh, or an ink-filled pad over a stencil and left behind the image on the paper. And operators could make stencils by insert, inserting this special uh, waxed paper into an ordinary typewriter, and then they could type onto it, and then that waxed paper could in turn be, uh, become the stencil for a mimeograph. Now, the stenciled mimeograph image couldn't match the sharpness of printing or typewriting, and stencils would deteriorate over the course of a print run. But nonetheless, the mimeograph made small run duplication possible, and they were useful to businesses and especially to churches. Um, the mimeograph competed uh, in popularity with another duplicating machine depicted here called the multigraph. The multigraph was manufactured by uh, the Cleveland-based American Multigraph Company. This company was formed in 1902 and obtained a patent for the device the next year. Like the mimeograph, this machine could rest on an office table. It's pretty easy to use. And it featured a round drum that was faced with slots that you could insert movable type onto. And by the second decade of the 20th century, the 19-teens, American Multigraph produced a separate typesetting device uh, that made it pretty easy to fix type onto the drum. And what you see on the right there is the typesetting device. You can set the type there, and then you roll the drum over it, and it's going to fasten to the drum. Um, and the multigraph then was, uh, it, it produced higher quality lettering than the mimeograph because it didn't use a stencil, and it was also capable of larger print runs because that drum wouldn't deteriorate like the stencil would over a course of a print run. And so American Multigraph became one of Cleveland's most important and uh, prolific industries. Uh, there's the building there with, its, uh, with the Ford cars out front, the old Ford cars. There's the building today, which I think is today the most uh, interesting feature in Cleveland, even more interesting than LeBron James, but that's another lame thing that I inserted there. So um, uh, now to save 
labor of typing individual addresses. Um, many well-outfitted churches purchased another new machine that was called an addressograph. This is also a tabletop contraption. The addressograph had a hopper where the operator would load a stack of metal plates, sort of like military ID tags, each of which was embossed with a unique address. And one by one, the metal plates would advance through the addressograph machine and the machine would press the plate through an inked ribbon uh, and left a unique printed address on an envelope or on the heading of a form letter. Um, here's an addressograph. On the right is the graphotype machine that actually made those little embossed plates. Um, and uh, the Chicago-based company just dominated uh, the aggressive addressograph market, wound up merging with the, the Cleveland-based multigraph uh, company in 1931 and actually combined the operations together into one machine, the addressograph multigraph. So with one, so you could crank the multigraph and run your, uh, run say a form letter through the multigraph, which had a blank space for the uh, addressee and the addressograph function would print, print unique addresses onto a form letter or something like that. Uh, so anyway, pretty handy. Um, all right. Uh, now, uh, a series of advertisements is interesting. The, the uh, addressograph multigraph company had branch offices in cities all across the country. And it was one of the most conspicuous advertisers in business magazines. And we see in 1922, I go through these ads and I home in on 1922. Uh, these, are, these are the types of offices that benefit from the multigraph. And by, by 1920, it was the April issue of 1922, I zeroed it down, where they uh, identify churches as one of the key places where these multigraphs are so useful. Um, and uh, here is an ad that is specifically targeting churches. Um, this, and the periodical itself, which was launched in 1924 that the ad appears in, is called Church Management, which itself is, a, is revelatory. Um, here's an aggress addressograph ad. Uh, and this is from 1928, features a testimonial from Brooklyn Central Presbyterian Church. This is one of the best time savers we have, the pastor boasts. Um, this advertisement shows up in 1920. It's fascinating. This is the advertisement by an engraver who's selling cuts for church bulletins that you can attach to a multigraph drum. Now, the presence of this advertisement reveals that duplicating machines had, were becoming so common that they could support an aftermarket, a market where new entrepreneurs could develop products and sell them on the assumption that the church has owned a machine like this. Um, were, were they not prolific, you wouldn't see advertisements uh, showing up like this. So before the advent of these machines, only a handful of large urban churches could publish their own bulletins and newsletters, but now that just became standard practice in churches. The mimeograph, the multigraph, the addressograph allowed Protestants to turn their local churches into small little publishing and mailing houses. Um, and this uh, reshaped their communities. What came of it? Well, uh, experts in church publicity entered the fray. Uh, one of them urged Protestants to embrace these desktop duplicators, explaining that uh, when a church member sees his own religious act or his own community's religious activities described in print, they solidify the member's sense of connection within the local church. In his words, it, put fol it put, puts folks on their metal when they recognize that people will be watching them as a member of the church. He went on to say that when parishioners read about what other church members are up to in the, in the church newsletter, they realize that they are not wholly alone in the community. Parishioners began identifying with one another through their shared experience of reading about local church life. They enjoyed church activities that they had not even attended. They enjoyed them by per participating vicariously by reading about them. Another church management expert summed it up well when he praised one church bulletin because he says, it was excellent for cementing the thought of the people to the church. Now, of course, for all of its purported benefits, small scale publishing entered church life at a cost. Any community formed around print surrenders a measure of personal contact. 
The obvious advantage, advantage of print is we're all familiar. Print enjoys over real-time face-to-face human contact is print's capacity to reach more people with greater regularity. A scrap of writing can stretch across distances and outlive the person who wrote it, but writing can do this only because writing is, to a degree, an impersonal medium. Socrates recognized this. He observed that writing separates human bodies from one another and inserts paper and ink between them, although in Socrates' day it wasn't paper and ink, but you get the idea. Writers can write without having any personal contact with readers, and their readers are reduced to an undifferentiated class, stripped of their individual qualities. And this brings us then to uh, form letters that, pra- that became part of pastoral practice at this time. It's really interesting to read in, about how this took shape. Uh, the multigraph in particular was pop- uh, made this possible. It turned out the most effective form letters because unlike copies generated by mimeograph, readers couldn't tell any difference between a multigraphed copy and a personalized typewritten original. Multigraph users learned to leave a blank space uh, on each copy where the addressee's name and address could be individually typed, dear blank, and you could type the name individually, or better yet, you could print the address with the addressograph. But this ability to print, to to add personal names and addresses to a multigraphed copy transformed the way pastors interacted with their parishioners. Now, the personal letter had a certain form and structure to it. Uh, letter writing by this time had followed conventions that date, date way back to the Middle Ages, even before the time of Gutenberg and movable type. In the 1920s, pastors began to write form letters, and form letters imitated the familiar conventions of the personal letter. They appeared just like personal letters, but they conveyed a uniform message that was duplicated and disseminated to a large number of recipients all at once who were undifferentiated from one another. Put simply, multigraphs made it possible for pastors to send out impersonal messages posing as personal ones. And because form letters were new to church life, many pastors sought advice about how to create them. And that's what I have superimposed here. Uh, This article that appeared in Church Management coached pastors on how to compose what the author described as form letters to unseen groups. And the phrase is revealing, form letters to unseen groups. It indicates a shift from personal to impersonal in pastoral care. Now, the overwhelming reader response to this, the pastors who responded to this particular column, convinced the publisher that we need to have a regular series of columns instructing pastors on how to compose form letters because it's a new thing. It's kind of interesting to read uh, people coming to grips with the ability to understand what a form letter is and to how to compose one. And there's a literature then that develops on how to, how to do this. It becomes part of how to be a pastor. Um, It's uh, interesting. There's a lot of uh, church advisors, church consultants at this time. Uh, There's one 1925 instructional manual that's really interesting about um, uh, the author says that the key to a successful form letter was to hide the impersonal nature of a mass message and make it appear, of course, personal. Um, He gives advice in his words about how to disguise the fact that it's a form letter. Um, He advises pastors to uh, not to put their name at the bottom in print, but rather just get, you know, sign the signature by hand, he says, just so that they'll think that it's an original letter just to you. Even better yet, if that's if that's going to make your hand tired, then order an engraver to make an engraving of your signature so you can fasten that to your multigraph drum. All this effort that went into camouflaging the impersonal nature of form letters indicates that most Protestants still valued personal face-to-face interaction as the norm for pastoral care. Form letters came up short of this ideal, so pastors had to develop rhetorical strategies to compensate for it. All right, now, uh, this brings me to this character here, Frederick Winslow Taylor. The impersonal nature of print culture is just one facet of a much wider trend toward impersonalism that the administrative revolution brought into congregational life. Administration itself emerged at this time as specialized work 
at the turn of the 20th century. And the pioneer who's associated with this development is Frederick Winslow Taylor. He was a pioneer and leading proponent of the theory of scientific management. Taylor studied workflows with an aim to maximize efficiency in the expenditure of time and of money and of human resources and labor. Uh, the influence of Taylor and others launched management as a field all its own. Eventually, Taylor's ideas are going to form uh, in Harvard uh, the first master of business administration using uh, Taylor's principles of scientific management as an organizing text for this new discipline in the early 19, in the 19 aughts. And then others adapted Taylor's theories to, into other areas. Morris Cook adapted scientific management principles to the field of education. Christine Frederick applied them to housewifery and pioneered the field of home economics. Um, these characters, uh, William Leffingwell, applied uh, Taylor's ideas to the various clerical functions in most office spaces and Protestants applied them explicitly to their religious practice. Shalier Matthews was a very prominent Baptist leader and ecumenical organizer uh, and urged Protestants to apply Frederick Winslow Taylor's ideas in their church operations. And his book, Scientific Management in the Churches, pictured here on the right, contributed to a rising demand for administrative expertise in Protestant church life. You need somebody in those church offices or you need administrators and, uh, and space for them to operate in. And so during this time, and this is one of the things that I do in my research, I read this scintillating theological literature, uh, a proliferation of practical handbooks uh, just starts showing up again and again and again. Um, look at this, uh, Albert McGarrett is a church efficiency expert. Um, and there's, you've got other people, uh, you know, how to make the church go. Here's one on church publicity, church finance, um, uh, church administration, and uh, so on. Accountants, managers, and efficiency experts emerged as important figures in church life during this time period. The Presbytery of Chicago, um, at, at, on the left, I should say, uh, Charles Stelzel is a church efficiency consultant, advertises in no less than the New York Times um, because there's such a demand for this. On the right, uh, the Presbytery of Chicago had become convinced that pastors needed managerial assistance to help them lead their churches. And so in 1908, they launched a school designed to prepare efficiency experts for church work. They called it the Presbyterian Training School. And this institution drew students by pointing out that efficiency is one of the slogans of the times. And this school met a demand for church personnel who could help Protestants adapt new fiscal and organizational met methods to their religious practice. All right, and now it's time to uh, turn to, uh, I won't get to that slide yet, but it's time to turn to the question of women's ordination. In their quest to uh, maximize efficiency, Presbyterians confronted the question of what place to give women in this newly transformed religious life. The push for efficiency introduced ambiguity about the relationship between administration and spirituality. Frederick Winslow Taylor had taught that because humans are the chief sources of mistakes and of inefficiencies, the key to efficiency lies in removing human idiosyncrasies from the productive process. Taylor termed older approaches to productivity as personal management and set his own scientific approach over against the personal approach. What's the opposite of scientific management? Personal management. I think that juxtaposition is important and revealing. Taylor said this, in the past, the man has been first. In the future, the system must be first. Taylor envisioned administrators as objective and purely rational beings stripped of individual personality. And these specialists served impersonal systems in the church. Now, you see, by downplaying an administrator's personality in the workplace, administration then defied easy categorization as either masculine or feminine. Should administration be considered men's work, like splitting wood or tempering steel? That's men's work kind of stuff, right? Or was it women's work, like mending clothing or washing pots and pans? In these early years of scientific management, 
administrators could be either masculine or feminine. Now, by this time, women had already proven themselves to be capable of organizers in both civic and church life. The turn of the 20th century, women's organizations were well established and they promoted literacy and education, temperance, poverty relief, women's suffrage. These, these women's organizations had formed networks and they combined their resources. They grew increasingly sophisticated in their administrative structures. The Presbyterian Training School for Christian Workers uh, sought enrollees from the ranks of women. This advertisement assures prospective women applicants that efficiency expert in, experts in the church played a different role than that of pastors and that women's involvement in church administration would not disturb traditional hierarchies that link spiritual leadership with masculinity. So because an administrator's presence in church organizations did not trouble gendered hierarchies, women could fill these new roles just as well as men could. And this consideration became a new factor in discussions about whether traditional ecclesiastical titles could be conferred upon women. Now, uh, let me go back to printing to help illustrate this point, although the point can be illustrated with any of the administrative functions that I'm describing here. The, operating of, the operation of duplicating machines had no clear attachment the, I'm talking about these little desktop duplicators that were new on the scene. They had no clear attachment to pre-existing gendered conventions of either masculine or feminine work. Um, so when you can th think of tools, for example, we might think of knitting needles or pots as women's tools, wrenches and hammers, men's masculine wrenches and hammers, um, knitting needles and pots, women's tools, right? So a tabletop duplicator, Men's tool, women's tool. It didn't fit any of the, with the grooves of any pre-existing paradigm either way. It was neuter. Um, so typing, for example, typewriters, by this time, uh, typewriters were familiar. And, uh, but these little tabletop duplicators, were they like typewriters that by the 1920s had become gendered as a woman's machine? Or... Were they like printers, which had become gendered as a men's machine? Were they, is that men's tool, women's tool? We see the uh, ambiguity of these small printing machines in a practical guide that appeared in 1922 called The Expert Typist. Uh, this manual includes a full chapter on how to, run, how to operate a mimeograph. And it offers step-by-step -step instructions about how to operate and service mimeographs complete with photographs for each step. The whole chapter is riddled with photographs. Some photos show the machine being operated by a man and others by a woman. We don't see their faces, but it's clear that one step is illustrated with a female operator and another step is illustrated. There he is with his, um, with his uh, male clothes here. So unlike typewriters that had come to be associated with women's work and unlike large printers that were associated with men's work, Tabletop duplicators remained kind of neuter, and this was so, and it's going to continue to be so for a whole generation. This will this will change around uh, after World War II, but for this time period, uh, they're gendered neutral. And so we see um, in the church ads here. The, this is an ad on the left from the American Multigraph Company uh, that appears in Church Management Magazine. Um, and it's representing its duplicating machine as operated by an obviously male church pastor with his coat off and his sleeves rolled up. But we also see women on the right operating a stencil duplicator. All right. So this brings us back around to where we began. Uh, my opening question. Why? Why was it in 1930, after a decade of debate, did Presbyterians approve the ordination of women as ruling elders? This decision had less to do with shifting views of women than it did with a wholesale reshaping of the office of ruling elder itself. Views of women were not changing nearly so much as views of what the office was, was changing. In an earlier era, prior to this administrative revolution, the ruling elder held an office of spiritual authority. Ruling elders assisted ministers in the spiritual oversight of the church whereas ministers of the clergymen preached and administered the sacraments. The vote that Presbyterians finally came to in 1929 to admit women to the office of ruling eldership 
indicated that the meaning of this office had shifted away from spiritual leadership, spiritual leadership being associated with masculinity, and to administrative function, which was impersonal and therefore neither masculine nor feminine. And this is precisely the analysis of uh, prominent mission secretary at the time. Um, he said this, and this is a revealing remark. He says, I think we may observe a distinction between the ordination of women to the ministry and their ordination to the eldership, he wrote. Ordination to the eldership is quite a different matter because eldership is very largely an office of administration. This person went on to describe how, of course, women had proven themselves as capable organizers, and so they were obviously fit to be ruling elders. The notion of what it meant to be an elder had changed given this transformation of church life. So bringing this all together, uh, in the early 20th century, a host of new administrative tasks became vital to the church's mission. And Protestant women could operate duplicators, they could prepare budgets, they could coordinate Sunday schools and perform other administrative tasks. The architectural accommodation for these activities became literal spaces for women to enter Protestant church life in ways that they never previously had. The old pastor's study was a masculine space, much like a lodge or something like that, as opposed to the kitchen, which is a feminine space, right? But the pastor's study is a different kind of space than a church office. These were office spaces, architectural spaces that derived their name from the impersonal and degendered functions that were form, performed within them. And as a result, Protestants began to see women as fit for ordination to ecclesiastical office. Now, as time went on, as women took on ecclesiastical titles looking later, as they entered church office spaces and operated printing machines, they helped to reshape church life. And things began changing by the mid-1940s. Church office spaces and the religious work done within those spaces came to be looked upon as work to be carried out by subordinates. Whereas back in the 20s, the time period I'm zeroing in on, the new work of administration had first introduced women into church office spaces. And the very presence of women in those spaces began to inform how Protestants assign meaning to office work. If women could do the work, then surely it must be subordinate work. But that's going to take a generation to work itself out. This study, I think, is important because it reminds us about the way history works. A story of women's ordination is not a story about how theology drives historical change. There are plenty of other motivating factors behind human actions besides the theological reflections that people are doing in the past. Unfortunately, I've known too many church historians who limit their gaze to theological ideas when they study the past. And when they do this, they often overlook some of the most crucial developments that actually shape the Christian church. History is much broader than the history of big ideas that people think. History is, is, is uh, <coughs> much broader than the, or church history is much broader than the theological ideas that church people think. Many have said that our action, actions flow out of our theology, but it's also important to remember that our theology flows out of our actions. The course of history is driven not only by big ideas, although I think ideas are important. <coughs> history is also made by the everyday habits and routines in the daily lives of ordinary people. And the reformers understood this, and I can bring this back around. This is a Davenant lecture after all, on, um, commemorating the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. And we should remember how seriously the reformers took religious routines. Um, how seriously they took things like architectural spaces. They were mindful of communication media, and so we should be as well. If church bulletins and newsletters transformed the way Christians identified themselves with one another in Christian community in the 1920s, maybe we need to take a more deeply serious look at the trade-offs we might make with new communication technologies we embrace today, with tweets and blogs and email, whatever it might be. How do our routines in our contemporary world shape our assumptions about how we relate to one another in the body of Christ? How does it shape our understanding of what it means to be an officer, for example, in the body of Christ? We have the title ruling eldership today. To what degree is, is the title of elder informed by the board chairman 
To what degree is it performed by the celebrity, someone who, to whom we attach leadership attributes, simply because they occupy a space within the domain of mass media? Is our notion of eldership informed by the office supervisor or the boss who lays out a scope of work and holds us accountable to perform certain tasks? How about the quarterback, another vision of leadership, who leads an offense down the field for a touchdown? Our cultural associations about leadership are, cha are shaped largely by the metaphors of business, of digital media, and of perhaps even sports today. But the church is the body of Christ, and it's not a business enterprise. It can't be reduced to any representation in a tweet. And the church is certainly not a sports team. The reformers reminded us to be careful and not let the world squeeze ecclesiastical offices into its mold. I think that we were somewhat asleep at the wheel in the 1920s and 30s, where the world squeezed our vision for an ecclesiastical office into its mold. But the operations of the church should inform and shape our understanding of worldly communities rather than the other way around. Thank you. Chris, you mentioned that um, someone on a mission board already began, I think it was in the 1920s, to formulate the office of elder as kind of an administrative office and made a sharp distinction between that and a pastor. Right. Um, and you said, well, clearly something had changed. Uh, what do you think led to that change besides simply the, you know, the rise of uh, this kind of mimeograph technology? Because which the, the change of... Ruling what, elder as a yeah, be, right. Because I mean, it's, it seems to me. I wonder whether we couldn't see that further back, right? Because uh, you know, the growth in the spiritual life is something that happens in the internal forum, and the reformers place a very sharp accent on the invisible church and that kind of the that life of holiness in the spirit. And you know, the Presbyterian elder you can't see into that, right? So what you've got then is a kind of a general policing of behaviors, like in Scotland or something. You know, maybe who's, who's really kind of living wildly that we can notice externally and or coordinating, um, you know, collective projects. But was there something in the Presbyterian idea of the ruling elder which was susceptible to that recasting in an administrative light before all of this happened or, or no? Um. So the, the question is, was there something in the, in the Presbyterian notion of ruling elder that made it the low-hanging fruit mm -hmm. so that it's going to be the one that is most vulnerable to these, to these sorts of things, uh, these sorts of changes? Um, I think I'll have to, that, that's a good question. And of course, you're trying to push back on my central premise. You're trying to find a theological explanation for this, aren't you? <laughs> Somewhere in the idea of ruling elder is a latent, a latent vulnerability to be warped. I'm, I'm posing ministry. a question rather than <laughs> rather than a theory. Okay. Um, I uh, I think uh, I think perhaps uh, if there was anything, but I don't think that this was a big aspect to it, okay. but that the ruling eldership was designed to be more broadly representative of the experience of the whole body of Christ, whereas ministers of word and sacrament were sort of set apart from that and distinctive. And so I think the ruling eldership is designed to be more responsive and connected with sort of the everyday lives and routines in certain respects. And maybe that's what made it more vulnerable. Um, it's hard, though, to, as much as I've studied this, as I look at uh, church office manuals and or uh, articles about church office, and it's interesting, they took the form so much more of manuals at this time than it, they did like theological reflection on what the office meant, um, just in the sheer tonnage of attention and column in inches spent. 
Um, I think that uh, maybe it was that that made it sociologically susceptible, that ruling elders are kind of tapped into the everyday life and experience more of others. So, um, but I'm speculating. Other questions? Yes, Rick. So it still seems to me, though, that the, the work of administration in, in the church and getting things printed up and communicating to the congregation and you know, keeping role for Sunday school and, and all that still seem to me to be very different roles than the role of ruling elder. Um, and so how do we, how, how does it cross that divide? So the, the question is that, uh, at least in Rick's mind, the role of ruling elder is distinct from the performance of functions like, you know, adding up budget columns and running off church bulletins and newsletters and editing and, and forming them. Um, I think that it is, uh, it's the benefit of hindsight that we have that draws those distinctions. Now, and I, I think it's easier for us today, um, who have been now for a couple of generations uh, in the wake of the administrative revolution that I'm describing, um, uh, we've had some time to reflect on it. And I think um, some, the, some robust theological reflection is able to kind of make those distinctions. But this is, these habits and routines were sort of coming into the church and being embraced and adopted because it was part of just how you exist. Like, you know, why wouldn't you drive a car to church? You know, if, because that becomes form of, rather than ambulation by foot, it's ambulation by internal combustion engine. You know, that's a, that's, in one sense it's innocuous, and in another sense it's profound. And people don't necessarily theologize about those things. Um, and it's hard for us now to remember or to even realize that Jonathan Edwards didn't have a church bulletin, and Charles Hodge didn't have a church bulletin, and Augustine didn't have a church bulletin, although that's just so ubiquitous and routine for us today. But uh, when that just some, comes into your practice, um, you don't, uh, it takes a while to form the vocabulary in order to speak into a practice that's already shaping you. And so I think it's, really just in the benefit of hindsight that it seems automatic to you that they're different, but it certainly didn't to folks then. All right, uh, Sam. Can you think of other technological innovations that have had sort of like similar theological implications in church history? <laughs> um, other technological innovations that have had similar sort of theological consequences in church history. I don't know, we, we can go to um, print and the codex and, uh, and developing the copyists um, throughout the Middle Ages. There's surely something technological going on there. I think with modern, uh, we could point to modern uh, transportation technology. Um, the, uh, the ability for administrators to travel from church to church to church to observe their Sunday schools. And so you have one administrator who can travel within a pretty short span of time throughout the entire Synod of Wisconsin, let's say, um, and train up all these churches and the ability to gather at a conference. Um, yeah, I mean, right now Toby's in Indianapolis. Uh, Pastor Toby's in Indianapolis in a conference. He's gonna be back in Moscow next week and he was here this, this past Sunday. That's pretty remarkable. That's transportation technology. And, uh, and I think that it has, just like families today, um, I mean, it's, uh, I think it affects the church too. Um, when, I, when you go to cemeteries, for example, you'll see the old family plot. Um, multiple generations of people with the same family name. You look at the dates and you look at the name and they're all kind of buried together. My grandfather is buried in Yakima my father almost certainly will not be buried in Yakima, but will be buried somewhere else. I'm probably going to be buried someplace different than my, father, than my own father. Um, that's just a, that's a profound trans, transformation right there with, with uh, transportation. I don't think we should reject these technologies. I have helped pass out church bulletins here at Trinity. Um, 
I don't think that's the answer. The, the answer is to be much more reflective about the trade-offs, though. And I think that the benefit of hindsight is to come in and see, you know, there's, a, there's always a trade-off when you're bringing these sorts of things in. Movable type is a blessing, and it also it, but it comes at a cost. Um, so I would say movable type too. Um, none of those are my areas of special specialty, though. So anyway, good question. Uh, Jacob, I think you had a question. Yeah, so it seems like there was like a, a utilitarian uh, permissiveness over and against the uh, the standards of scripture for um, who should be allowed to be elders. Mm -hmm. um, was there any? utilitarian like resistance so uh, we we, we uh, understand that there was resistance to women moving in the, into those executive positions we might call them executive they're, that's what they're called in the business world uh, for uh, based on the standards of scripture mm -hmm. but were the, were there was the resistance based um, on utilitarian reasoning uh, in other words uh, women maybe not being equipped did, did, did you find any of uh, that? Like you might have had in the business world, right? When you have uh, managers and administrators moving into executive positions or crossing over into that because they're taking on larger responsibilities. So, yeah, so I guess I'm asking, do you see that in the business world? Do you see that reflected back in churches that are trying to preserve the standards of scripture through um, other means? Um, you know, the question was, do, do we see the same utilitarian methods being used on the other side to try to preserve the standards of Scripture? In some ways, yes. In fact, in my, my work, and I actually have, there's a phase of it that I developed this rather robustly, but what we call the fundamentalists, um, who are the theological conservatives, one of the main things driving them is this very modernist impulse. Uh, they were trying to identify the key elements of the faith, the virgin birth of Christ and the miracles and his uh, bodily resurrection, his vicarious atonement and so forth, these, uh, and the inerrancy of scripture, these five fundamentals. And uh, those become the uh, things to circle the wagons around to defend because uh, they become this systematic recipe card standard. And this, this impulse to reduce things to a recipe card um, is coming out of the same efficiency movement. Um, it was very much a turn away from the confession of faith, uh, much more churchly understanding of church doctrine to this reductionist idea. And so people who are kind of called theologically conservative, I think were every bit as modernists as the modernists that they were fighting against um, by reducing, and J. Gresson Machen was somebody who pointed that out richly, he said, who cares about these five little bullet points? I'm for the, uh, my ordination vows are to the Westminster Confession of Faith, not to this little truncated recipe card of, of doctrine. Um, and they were willing to associate themselves with one another, Baptists, Presbyterians, Methodists, if they would subscribe to these five points. Um, then, uh, then the ordination vows and commitments to liturgies and governance practices and a host of other things would fall by the wayside because they're just rallying around these five points on the recipe card. So the fundamentalist movement, um, I actually argue, is coming out of the same, same development um, and embracing and reflecting the same, uh, same development. Um, and, uh, and I think that there were more churchly people at the time who were, who were seriously cautioning against that. And they would be much more of the conservative types. I, I don't know if that's the sort of example that you were fishing for, but there you go. All right. Uh, yes? So you said that um, this, this is related to why we see women pastors around us today. Um, well, women eldership, yes. Okay. Um, so in, in the 1940s at, uh, or 20s into 40s, they were still maintaining a distinction between spiritual roles and administrative. Right. Was, was that the foot in the door to Yes, exactly. The, the question was, um, this is asking about more subsequent to the time period that I'm talking about, but the question was, how about women pastors? I do think it's, it's interesting, and I think um, this, what I'm suggesting to you is the only adequate explanation 
to explain why Presbyterians considered in 1930, or 1929, 1930, when this vote was taken, um, they had women, it was put to a vote, should women be uh, pastors? Should women be ruling elders? And should women be evangelists? Or, or should women be deacons? They, they actually considered all of those things. And they, were, they accepted them as ruling elders and not as ministers of word and sacrament. Um, which is, and I think only if you understand this can you understand why that distinction was drawn. Now once women come into church offices in something that is so valued, and actually freighted with a lot of spiritual connotations as it was at the time, then, then a generation of that is going to give way to women becoming ministers of word and sacrament. It's 1956, uh, the first, pres in Northern Presbyterian circles anyway, the first ordination to word and sacrament of a woman. So that's from 1930 to 1956, that's 26 years. So you've got kind of a generation, and I'm, and I'm describing then this transitional period here, but that is, I think, the outcome of it. Okay, um, Mr. Warner. Were Catholic Church and diocese under the same, under the uh, sway of similar momentums that the Montreal was uh, for? The question is about uh, Roman Catholics and uh, how they were affected. You're, yeah, you're going to see uh, bulletins and newsletters proliferating just like you will see in businesses who write up sort of house newsletters so all the salesmen understand what's going on with the business practices and so forth. You're going you're gonna to see it uh, everywhere. Um, I haven't studied its, uh, its effects so much uh, in Roman Catholic communities. So I can't, I would only speculate as to what its concrete effects were. All right, Brent. So uh, I just have a comment about the, the um, sort of the rhetoric about women. So some people here may not be from a background where they believe, you know, women are not supposed to be in pastor Right. Or in eldership. And I think it would be helpful in the way you're presenting this overall to give some like a little bit of comments for why you feel it's important. Obviously, this is the, the viewpoint you have. And so just like a general comment on that, rather than, obviously, that's not the focus of the talk, but it can help people who might think otherwise, right? Mm -hmm. what, what is the reason? What is there, when you describe that in, in a nutshell? You know, is, the, uh, I mean, what are the theological arguments against yeah, women elders or women. In a nutshell, certainly it's not because women are bad. Oh, <laughs> well. <laughs> it's not like that, right? So. Well, yeah, cer certainly, well, um, and that, that was just well understood. Um, what, I guess the, the historian in me is, is asking the question, what, were, what was going through the minds and through the bodies and activities of the historical actors? Okay, and I think that this is, uh, this is what happened, whether regardless of your view of, of whether women should or shouldn't be pastors, we're talking about how, um, how that practice, we, how we moved from an, a, uh, just an assumed, you know, women shouldn't be, shouldn't occupy these offices to that women should. And, and that is a historically uh, contingent situation. And so these are, um, and so I'm tr trying to explain historically why. Part of my argument is that theological reflection on the question actually wasn't animating the change. Um, so I'm happy to reflect theologically on why I think women can't be pastors, but to do that, though, um, I think uh, is to uh, have a, I think, a valuable theological conversation, but it doesn't explain or describe how the practice changed, um, which is part of my argument. Yeah, so the so, logic makes sense. But I'm just saying, to, 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 in the premise of the discussion, it can help to let someone know why. Right, but why, why somebody would object because to that. The, the terminology of saying it's impersonal, for example, sounds negative, right? Impersonal? Like you're going towards this impersonal status, and then women come in. So it sounds like being right. a connotation of negativism okay. towards women, right? But right. certainly that's not personal. Oh, it's, it's not that women are not, it's a, it's a, what I'm talking about is a gendered analysis. It's, it's, it's neuter, so personal idiosyncrasies. 
including gender, um, are, were not informing the occupants of this ecclesiastical office and our notions of, of the occupants of ecclesiastical office. Um, and uh, Frederick Ch Winslow Taylor uses the term impersonal, and so I'm comfortable with it because it's a historically contingent term. So, yes. Um, when were, did, were women admitted to the diaconate in the same time as ruling elders, or what's the history of that? Yeah, the, the history of women at the diaconate, I am aware that there's actually quite a vast history of that, uh, of that question, actually dating back to the Reformation. You're, you'll even find some, uh, some churches that admitted women to the diaconate. Um, there's... There continue to be debates today about what the office of deacon is, um, whereas the the understanding of the office of ruling elder is settled sort of theologically and confessionally from the time of the Reformation, of course, with refinements. Um, but um, but it's in the early 20th century where that where the notion of what what's entailed in that office changes. Whereas I I know what the office of deacon. I'm not an expert in the question, but I know that, that there are all kinds of competing views of what constitutes a deacon. And so even you'll have very conservative reformers who have deaconesses um, going back in the 16th century, 17th century. And other people are saying, no, the office of deacon is like this, therefore it shouldn't be women. And that discussion has actually raged in, through the last 400 years in different ways. And, and I, frankly, again, haven't tracked the details of it. And so, But I do know that that's different. All right. Yes. So when um, something I've observed, something I've read about is that te technologies and techniques are uh, taken up by a group of people without the proper reflection. Uh, well, first that happens. There, let's just do this because it's efficient or mm -hmm. whatever it is. Um, Things don't stand still, so eventually, even if they're acquired, the, these techniques are acquired without any moral reflection, eventually they become a, a, a moral criterion. Um, oh, you're not on Facebook protesting abortion. What's wrong with you? So that, that's something that we run into uh, nowadays. Um, so, know that uh, mostly this was. These administrative techniques were adopted out of um, desire for efficiency. Or, mm -hmm. you know, they weren't saying, hey, you know, James says this, Paul says this, let's get a machine. They just said, let's get a machine. Uh, but at some point, did they start attaching Bible verses to it? Or did they start saying, uh, hey, you churches and the hinterlands, get, get with the program, get these machines, get one of them by like that. Was there any sort of development along those lines? Yeah, the, the question is, is there any, any sort of development um, along the lines of um, making it a moral imperative to adopt these methods and practices to bring in, to have a church office space, to have uh, duplicators? And I would say the answer is yes. Um, a church that, um, in some of the promoters, I, I just, that spate of literature that I kind of barrage you with up there, you'll see language like that about how it's pastorally untenable um, to, uh, to fail to publish a newsletter in this modern day and age um, because this is where people are and we need to, and the gospel applies to people and, and how else could you do anything but to reach them. Um, and efficiency methods, uh, there were strong, strong moral imperatives for, uh, for driving the support of organizing and why we need to organize. Um, making sure that um, coming up with systems of visitation and reducing that to certain systems. Well, your parishioners are not going to be properly visited uh, unless you reduce that to a certain kind of system. So there was a lot of talk about that. Um, you know, you don't want people in the church falling through the cracks. Also, uh, in connection with giving, it's a moral imperative to give. And so the accounting regimes of giving um, also becomes a uh, moral imperative. Uh, you know, shepherding and stewarding God's resources. Um, and, and so, of course, we need to have accountants reviewing these books and 
and that sort of thing. Uh, some of that thinking I don't think is, uh, I don't believe is uh, misguided necessarily. Um, you know, there's a reason why we here at Trinity Reformed Church have two deacons rather than one count the offering. Um, that's a system uh, that we adopt, and that's so, um, and that's, that's not necessarily something that you might have thought of according to the standards and norms 200, 250 years ago, but um, in terms of what's regarded as responsible financial management today, I think that's prudent. And I don't want to disconnect that or decouple that from any moral analysis whatsoever. Um, but it comes, it reinforces the point we need to reflect on these things. How are these practices and habits and routines shaping us? Um, and how is the church shaping the world um, as well? So, anyway, yeah, but the short answer to your question is yes. People moralized about this, and you would be uh, deficient as a pastor or deficient as a church if you didn't adopt some of these practices. That's very clearly. So, I don't know where we, where we are for time. Is the time up? Could do one more. One one more question. Is there one more question? Nobody wants to hold us up with one more question. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I thank the uh, Davenant Institute very much for hosting this. Thank you all for coming and have a delightful evening. And I think there's something. You know, any further announcements? Yeah. Right. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Slack.